The Seat Arona, the new small SUV, is today in our full review on Autogo Fuel, your number one resource for in-depth car reviews and your number one community to discuss cars today with Thomas. We're going to take a detailed look on the exterior, interior and drive this one here today. And we picked the equipment and you know how the car is laid out and trim and engines, probably the way it will be sold most. And we will also show you different colors, different exterior and interior trims, Excellence FR and also drive another engine, the 1.5 liter Evo. So a lot of variation. Let's take a look at that in a close up here in full HD, full screen and full length. Let's go. So first of all, it looks like a small Ateca, but it does share the platform, the MQB A0 platform with the upcoming smaller SUVs from Škoda, probably be Škoda Polar and the VW T-Cross, supposed to be those names. And of course, also the Seat Ibiza is the very same platform, but it's a little bit higher than the normal Ibiza. The headlights here, optional LED, standard would be halogen and they have this very attractive daytime running light. 4 meters 14 or 13 foot 6 is the total length, so it is still a small car. It is 3 centimeters higher than a normal Seat Ibiza, so more the crossover, the small SUV, but also 8 centimeters longer, so you have a little bit more boot space. We'll take a look at that very soon. However, you still have the very compact sizes or small sizes and it is only about 750 euros more expensive than a normal Ibiza. It starts at about 16,000 euros taking German reference prices and when you go a higher trim level, this one here is the style trim level, so more middle trim level, I'd like to show you that. If you go higher, you're about 24, 25, also com combining with the engines, so still a relatively good offer. What else can we see in the side profile? those plastic bumpers in the lower part to ensure the off-roadish look also around the wheel arches. 17 inch rims which are totally enough you know from the size. I think they look pretty well on the car. Also we have the design line on top of the door handles and then it gets exciting because you can get a contrasting roof. Optional. You can also get it all in the vehicle color but then it is possible to have gray, black or orange as the contrast color, no matter which other color you pick. And overall, there are 68 color combinations available then. And if you have the contrast roof, but also if you put it just in a vehicle color, which looks to me a little bit more elegant. The question is, do you want it rather elegant? Then pick the same color. Do you want it a little bit more extraordinary? Then go for the contrast as seen here. And this X blade basically here, a little bit like the X-Men. This is separating the roof area and the lower upper parts. So even if you pick it in vehicle color, the top part, you still have this differentiation right there to have something, you know, like an extra eye candy effect. And by the way, some are always interested in that rear disc brakes here because 115 horsepower with the small cars, it's usually like below 90, 95, 100 horsepower, something like that is the level to break even. Below that, usually drum brakes, above that, disc brakes. And now to the rear with those LED taillights, also horizontally drawn. It really looks like a normal MQB hatch in the rear, like many other cars. So the more spectacular feature is surely the side profile. 
but SUV ish alike. You get the plastic bumper in the lower part. This is really handy, especially for you know smaller bumpers that might happen in the city. So they have also thought about the practical effect of this vehicle. And the Arona, the badge is actually quite prominent. This is maybe also a new trend among the newer models coming out now to be more open also about the model name. Not putting it very small there, but really like, hey, this is me, I'm the Arona. And now to some more variation for you. We have here a Nevada white car, and this one here is Desire Red. This one here is Excellence, and this one is the FR trim level. The FR trim level, you can also see the logo in the front right there. It looks a little bit sportier. More changes, of course, to the inside also, which we're going to show you later, the differences there. And also the FR can be bought in the combination with the 1.5 liter Evo engine. So the thing is, those two are basically connected. You can get the FR trim for other engines, but you cannot get the engine with another trim level. Did you get that? It's a little bit complicated, but that's how it is. <laughs> so let's take a short look around some other features right there and later on also compare the interior. On this FR vehicle we have the maximum rims attached, 18 inch in a two color scheme, pretty impressive for sure, and we also have the black contrast roof in combination with the Desire Red. Again, you could also have this car completely in Desire Red, which would be, I think, among my favorites for sure. Other than that, you see uh, even the base model Arona, they look pretty much the same, it's more about rim choices, exactly, um, you know, how impressive do you want it to look, how, a little bit sportier, a little bit more off-road-ish, so that's really up to you. So I'm hiding in the woods here. There I am. <laughs> Let's take a look at the rear here. So the FR also has a sporty rear way with those uh, fake exhaust tips. They look, of course, a little bit sportier. Again, you can argue about if fake exhaust tips are useful or useless, I don't know. And FR, Bose and the Excellence, they also come with this a bright plate here in the, uh, in the lower part. So that stresses again a little bit of the crossover look. Um, I think the, you know, the, the gray part, it does fit the vehicle. Or what do you think? Here with the Excellence vehicle, we have a white and gray mix. Again, colors are of course not bound to the trim levels. So you can get either paint. But just to show you some more variation, what is possible with the vehicles. We've got the same optional 18-inch rims mounted here. And also in the rear you can see that we have the, uh, the gray element right there, just that the Excellence does not get the fake exhaust tip that the FR has. So which trim from the exterior do you like best so far? And which color do you like best? Of course we will see also those two additional vehicles very soon again when we compare the interior to show you some stylings and trim levels there too. So here we have the key, pretty standard, solid door closing sound and actually solid door handles. Then they have some spots where they saved money to keep the price low also. And that is for example at the inside of the door, there's the hard plastics. Um, this one here is you know, from, from leatherette and lower part, well, is basically with every vehicle. But you can also put large bottles in here, that's, that's coming quite handy. 
Then the interior is, well, you can individualize a lot of things. This one here, the more subtle setup. You can see, for example, those uh, matte gray decor elements, but you can also make it more colorful if you like. A pretty slim steering wheel. And this one is the style trim level. And so you have those gray fabric seats. They look really great. Um, with different materials. They keep you warm in winter and are cool enough in summer. It's a good material finish as well and it's very comfortable. You see, for a small car, it offers you also a lot of room. Um, Excellence, for example, you can also, and the FR, you can also get the Alcantara seats. Alcantara inside and leather on the outside. That is also recommendable if you want to get something a little bit more fancy. Those ones here, the analog instruments, by the way and uh, digital instruments will be available also for this vehicle by mid-2018. And let's get inside. Shoe tap. <laughs> and the interesting thing is, well, I said earlier, this car sits three centimeters higher than the Ibiza, but you sit five centimeters higher. And you do feel that, you have a very good overview right here. And this is really the advantage of a compact SUV or a small SUV in this case here, you can already say that Good overview, upright seating position, good for tall people at 1 meters 86 or 6 foot 1. Enough headroom left, definitely. A lot of space to move around. And again, you don't have to crouch in that much. It's also an easier entry and getting out again. The steering wheel can be adjusted in all the areas. It's very good functionality, that's for sure. And a bright ceiling here today, by the way. You will soon see more deals about that. Manual pumping up your the seat. But that's totally fine. Not everything has to be electronic. All works pretty well. Um, I just prefer to have handles for the rear part of the seats and not those turning knobs. But I mean, you can get along with it. And now the interior overview right here. You have a design line on the top part. This one here again, hard pack. This is again something where they try to save some money. Then the matte gray element, decor element, again, you can get it in different colors if you want it, but that's subtle and matte is also good. It doesn't collect fingerprints. What does collect fingerprints is the optional eight inch screen. You can also get a 6.5 inch if you want to save some money. The eight inch then the full glory screen here with two knobs still left. That's different to some other modern infotainment systems. Soon more deals for that. AC unit below that. Here also in a two-zone scheme for driver and co-driver. It's a nice comfort feature for sure, seat heating. Below that, two USB ports and also the inductive charging platform. And you can easily reach it. It's enough space for all sizes of mobile phones. It's nice that the heartbeat signalized and start-stop engine button and six-speed manual gearbox today. The steering wheel, again, pretty slim in a sporty Seat style. I like the analog instruments also because they have this white background which looks very sporty. I'm not sure if I would really need the digital gauges in this one, but the extra price next year will be about 500 euros, I guess. Overall, a clean interior. It looks somewhat fancy here with nice entertainment, zoom more function to that. I think, good job, and yes, I would have loved to have softer materials on top. The question is always who touches it and who sees it that it's soft. I think we can surely discuss that in the comments. So now to the infotainment system, you have this app view. You can click on different things. For example, also the GPS, there it is. And it's quite responsive. You can use it like a smartphone. See the speed right here, does a good job. You can still zoom in and out with the knob. That's, you know, quite good function, especially while you are driving. And you also have those hotkeys on the left side for radio, for example, for media, also to the phone Bluetooth connection. That's one thing. This one, the last one is for speech, um, you know, speech to input. Then the GPS hotkey in the right part. Here, yeah, this is then the other solution you can plug in with a cable for the smartphone mirroring functions and some you know vehicle overview driving status for example is also available and on the right part again this would be uh, the general app overview and by the way if you put a smartphone in the lower part 
which does have the inductive charging option, you also get a signal then, not only from the smartphone, also in the top part, the logo appears and says, yeah, I got the smartphone, it's charging, then you know it is working. The loft box, standard size, slides down softly, but has no cooling function. Sun visor, like this, also has a mirror. Uh, there's no light inside. I mean, as soon as long as there is light outside, you can also see very well here. You know, uh, we were recently asked also to show this one here. It's the same, by the way, on the cold driver side that you can, you know, check your makeup a little bit or maybe just stare at yourself and say, wow, I look really great today. <laughs> Cup holders are rather shallow. What is interesting is they have a rubber button. <laughs> you can remove it to clean it then. Oh, sweet. Same for this small case here. Um, you can put the key there, manual handbrake. Then the middle armrest is really fixedly attached. Some more space right there, but as shown you earlier, the two USB ports are in the front. So now to the rear compartments. Course. That is also another advantage if you compare it to the Seat Ibiza. Um, however, you know, already in the Ibiza you have quite good knee room. It's a small car, you still have some space left, even if you're a tall driver in the front. The feet go under the seat. Headroom is really plenty. Especially if you do not have the panoramic roof. Uh, if you go for that one, still working. So it's also a comfortable seating position here in the rear. This car totally works for four adults. Well, in the middle part, you could theoretically also sit, but there's also you know, a middle tunnel, um, although it's just front wheel drive. But you know, then again, it's also not the biggest car. What is interesting, there's a small seat belt holder for the rear seat. So if you're not using them, they're also kept you know, in a very tidy position. There are Isofix points on the outer seats and you flip the seat from here and it is a one-third, two-third split, top tether on the back part and of course we're going to take a look how it looks like from the trunk. So it is really nice and bright in this interior, especially with the bright ceiling, I love that. And visually it looks like from one piece, also quite attractive. Wait a minute, from one piece? There's nothing attached to it? Hmm, there are no handles at all, so there's no hanger to put your jacket. And also for the rear passengers and for the co-driver, no handles here to grab onto. Hmm, that is again a result of coast cuts, so they try to keep the production cost low as well and try to reduce it to the minimum. The question is, and I want to hear your feedback on that, is that okay, you know, in order to keep the price low, to uh, leave out those, or would you say, I really use those very often in my car life experience, I would like to have those, let's share your opinion, your experience there. And now, what about the boot space? Here we are, so you can have this even loading sill if you like, 400 liters is the capacity, by the way, and it is also possible to put this one lower, like this, then you have a little bit more space in height. And below that is, by the way, a replacement tire and also sound system parts. And we can also flip those seats, as we've shown you earlier. But you have to, you know, rather go around than do it like this. You do have this step then, so it doesn't go all the way through if you put it lower. But again, you can also remove that right Again, so putting hand restraints up, put the front seat to the to the forward part as well. This one, by the way, is a warning triangle pack. You can also remove that one. And then if we put this one here in the upper position again, then we will also have the possibility to load through on the even surface. And now let's compare the FR trim from the interior. You can see here red contrast stitches. And then you can also get those optional sport seats. They have a little bit more side support. And Alcantara on the inside and leatherette on the outside. 
again, you can also have the other seats, but this one here, of course, fits the FR trim very well. Also, different steering wheel. It's a little bit thicker. It has the FR logo right there. And also the flat bottom. Again, more contrast stitches here with the leatherette on the dashboard. So it looks a little bit more premium-ish. And let's get inside, test the difference with those seats. Um, as I said earlier, the normal seats are also very comfortable. Those ones here, however, as they have a little, little bit more side support and look and feel a little bit more premium together with the uh, thicker steering wheel, makes a little bit different impression then. And I had the same impression with the Ibiza. So when you have the, uh, you know, the FR trim here with those sport seats then, you feel like you would be driving a Seat Leon. And that makes the car you know, appear even a little bit bigger. Also, you might remember, you know, the style vehicle, which had those even um, covers right there with a matte point. Here is a soft touch material from the, with the leatherette. That's also a very interesting idea. So definitely, I do like the FR trim. Um, well, seating comfort wise, for some people, the sport seats will be more comfortable even. Um, I also like them very much, definitely. I also like the Alcantara surface, it looks good. Um, however, just climate comfort wise, you have to know that the pure fabric will even stay a little bit cooler in summer than the Alcantara. However, the Alcantara will be a little bit cozier in winter times. And here again the view on the interior, again with this you know, soft touch leatherette right there as a replacement to the uh, just hard pack decor elements. Also a little bit more subtle in the coloring. I think it does add really some more premium feeling also you know with the steering wheel again so i think for me the fr trim would be a way to go really looks very nice so to be clear again when do you get what in the most markets and also for example in germany it might sometimes depend from market to market but the info we have so far from the prices is when you get the fr trim you do get the sport seats included with more side support but with normal fabric surface. And then the Alcantara surface, and also the other elements you see in Alcantara, is the Alcantara package, which is then again optional. A little bit complicated, but so just that you know when you order one that you get it exactly right as you want it. And for the rear, you also get the leatherette inlet here at the inside of the doors to make it softer. And the rear seats also have the same Alcantara leatherette scheme. So I think it's a very interesting idea, very nice. Oh, and also the seat belts you see here with red contrast. Now the excellence interior. Here you can pick different colors again. This one here in white, corresponding to the white exterior. Then we have this um, attractive cloth on the inside of the doors with black and white mix, basically the white dots. Also nice solution. Then the seats, well, first of all, you have got this excellent entry batch. And here also fabric seats. Again, with white contrasts on the outside and white cloth on the inside. The seats are really very well done overall. I mean, no matter which room. And then here the steam wheel, white contrast stitches on the inside. Also the excellence, or the X also as a logo. And you can also see in the cockpit that we have, you know, how it works with the white trim. So the white matte trim here, also left and right next to the steering wheel. Again, another interesting solution. And that looks like this here in our excellence trim in the rear. And if we take a look here at the rear seats, same interior style. If we take a look in the front, that's how the cockpit looks like from, the, from behind with the white decor elements. Surely a very fresh look. So as for engines, what do you need to know? 95 and 115 horsepower, both for petrol, as we see it right here now. But this is here a one liter displacement, turbo petrol engine. In this case, the one today with 115 horsepower and manual gearbox. And same with the diesel. It's just a 1.6 liter diesel. The only difference is that with the diesel, the 95 horsepower variant can be combined with DSG seven speed 
and here the stronger one, the 115 today with manual hand drive, but this one could also be combined with the DSG, with a dual clutch transmission. And what else do you have available? You also have the TGI 90 horsepower CNG engine and also the 1.5 liter Evo 150 horsepower that would be the top engine. So welcome to our test driving part and we will start today on the motorway of course later on we'll also show you some slower driving with some more dynamic handling but the motorway is of course always good to, uh, to test the engine and also you know long-term consumption and stuff so um, what about some first acceleration when we go from 75 in the third gear to 100 let's go That's it, 100. So this one liter engine has some good performance, even higher speeds on the motorway. It was not tuning up too loud. Actually, it's quite silent engine-wise. You can also put the sixth gear. So here again, as I said earlier, one liter displacement, turbo engine, 115 horsepower, and the manual drive, six speed, optionally also get the 7-speed DSG with wet, uh, sorry, no, the 7-speed DSG has dry clutch, so, um, because this one here doesn't have too much newton meter of torque, so that will also easily withstand this pressure. So what do you realize when driving the Arona the first hand? It is such an easy vehicle, so it is super easy to handle, you have a very good overview, just the back mirror is a little bit slim, um, but especially the front, you have a very good visibility, almost a panoramic view. You sit higher than in the Ibiza, that is clear, so you have a more upright seating position. In this case, then it's also more comfortable than an Ibiza, in general, than a normal small car. So, if you're thinking about small car or small SUV, well, what are the pros, what are the cons? One con is, when you're driving in now at 120 km an hour, it's getting louder on the motorway than you would have, for example, experienced in a Seat Ibiza. So the car stands you know, a little bit taller against the wind. So you have to uh, bear that in mind. So it's not the best high-speed motorway vehicle, for example. However, then again, you have the more upright seating position, the better overview, so you gain then more seating comfort, for example. That again is a very good point for sure, and this overview again. Then we have also the ACC here, that is an optional feature, keeps the distance to the car in front of us, it's a very good feature, especially in combination then with the DSG. Um, I would really say, uh, this one is a, probably the most comfortable combination, ACC plus DSG, because then the speed is also reduced until zero. Uh, with the manual drive, at some point, the engine would be stalled, you know, and then uh, you cannot reduce the speed even longer. The car feels very stable on the road. And again, I think the most crucial thing is that it's so easy to control. You start driving, you feel eased, feel so much in control and you don't have to learn the car and I think that's also really crucial. So what about lane changing? Also at higher speeds the car remains relatively stable so suspension is not too soft. Of course it's a little bit softer than we would have had in a, in a Ibiza in a, or in a Polo in a small normal car which is not an SUV but it is firm enough. I think they found a good compromise and also uh, you know, 
how bumps are evened out. Um, you know, here we also do not have the adaptive suspension, but no, we don't really need it. It's not uh, not entirely necessary. So you'll be just fine with the standard suspension, and I can really say you will definitely be very happy with it. The three-cylinder sound, by the way, is at some point even quite nice. It's um, finally sounding sounding better than the four-cylinder sound. You know when you push it also, you know, in the higher gears, for example. It's really funny finding too. So shifting, I found it very smooth. Um, I think some other testers mentioned that it would be somehow, you know, not smooth enough, but I cannot share the view. I think, uh, you know, the way you shift, it's not really long. Also, don't have big resistance right there. It feels a little bit sportier than, for example, in the Škoda Fabia. Let's see where we go. go on here. So you're you're actually still agile enough. You can see it right here. Also, the pretty slim steering wheel adds some sportiness. So very well in control. You see here, there's no not too much tilting from the vehicle. So again, suspension is a good comfort compromise, good control. The steering is direct, so also progressive. You see here also the very small commands are directly transported to the road. I like that. That is uh, good for sporty driving, for sure. But it's also good when you're in the city, for example, and you know, searching parking lot, turning the steering wheel around all the time. That's also coming handy for that. Then if you look to the side mirror, there it is, the blind spot monitor, which you can optionally get. Very useful function, I like that. But more important is that the front assist is uh, included in the standard equipment. So uh, that is the auto uh, automatic emergency brake. If you, you know, miss something at some point, especially also inside the city, I think that's very crucial and the blind spot monitor would probably be the next feature I would definitely go for because it can really save lives you know at some point everyone has missed or will miss uh, a blind spot right there and then it's really crucial so now we're entering a uh, city of Barcelona to show you some more city traffic that's of course also a big part of this vehicle there we go blind spot monitor active. If you're not driving too fast, then it's also better with the sound insulation. You'd really feel a difference to the Ibiza. It's only happening when you're at higher speeds, because the car stands higher. So that's again, I think, probably the only disadvantage we have here with, with this vehicle, if you compare it to normal small cars. We have to live with that then. So, let's see, when we're at about 80 or 75 kilometers an hour, fifth gear, and we're running below 2,000 RPM. Um, I've been riding fairly a steady speed now. There was one big acceleration, but you know, it's also happening in, in real-time driving. Um, and the consumption now says it's about six liters on 100 kilometers. And uh, we also tested that before a little bit and also approximately reached the same conclusion. So this is a realistic figure. Funnily, I recently had the exact same engine in the Škoda Octavia, which is a bigger car, of course, and also a little bit heavier. And we had the very same consumption figure. So, obviously, it doesn't matter that much then if it's, you know, 200, 300 kilograms more or whatever. How much heavier is the Octavia than the... Let's get off here now. How much heavier is the Octavia than the Arona? I think 150, Thomas? Yeah, maybe. 150 kilograms? Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Think so. yeah, but obviously it doesn't matter that much. I think the consumption figure is still quite okay. Of course, with here, you know, a little tinier car, it should be a little bit lower. That would be cool. So we need to turn right here now. 
I, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to turn right. Well, I could, but if people leave me through, we could check if that's possible in Spain to get from the very left lane to the out, outer right lane. Maybe people are friendly, seeing, oh, there's a new Seat Arola. It's a product here, basically made in Barcelona. Hmm, will that be nice? We'll see. Here when standing still now at the traffic light. Just here a little bit from the AC, uh, which we you know, have a two-zone control here, optional at the moment. So we can control it to our needs. So the first lane I can easily get. Also leave me through there. Very nice people. Gracias, muy bien. <laughs> so that's it's how it's supposed to work. And then we can also be nice and let some people walk over the road. That's how traffic is supposed to work. Be nice to each other and so someone else will also be nice to you. Wow. Now good thing to test the sunshade and it's really well blocking out the sun. Although I'm still able to have a wide windscreen view, so that's also good. So that's now I think straight, right? Is it straight or is it? I uh, think right there. Right. Yeah. So <coughs> a little bit confused. But I mean, in in general, the GPS has a good view. Um, I think it's yeah. Now we have a good good zoom was a little bit too late with the zoom but other than that you have a very good visualization we also always cancel the voice commands when we drive of course I think it's also a good experience to tell you if we can really find a proper route according to the GPS uh, when you don't have the speed mounted in there you can also have some uh, small GPS info in 2d style so you can either have a digital speedometer in the very middle part that is possible and here GPS info then shows me the arrow, just arrow says going straight. So especially here in those small narrow streets, the vehicle feels very well, feels totally at home uh, because again you have the better overview which is a little bit more upright. This will especially help people who are a little bit you know tinier and usually cannot see so much over the road. That's super helpful and I mean, we had some, now when we have some bigger vehicles in a test and we're driving to narrow city corners and stuff, sometimes you get a little bit nervous because ah, do I scratch the alloys left and right and maybe too wide at some point, what about the side mirrors? But here that's the total advantage of, the, of such a small car. And to me the biggest advantage here of a small SUV is you still have a very short length car is not that wide but due to the upright seating position and the the comfort that the small SUV is offering you still feel like you would be driving a bigger car comfort wise I think um, that's really the the biggest strength and um, you know for for most people this size will also already be enough if you just think you know in a, in a practical way also I mean we showed you other even in the rear you can uh, can fit more people that really works so this car is definitely at home in the city from driving I think we could take uh, a lot of positive aspects now the last driving part will drive a little bit more agile uh, we are driving up um, Mont Mont Barcelona inhabitants will surely know that very famous but also a lot of tourists of course so, so many tourists coming here they uh, you know it's changing a little bit some inhabitants here say you know it's becoming too much of tourism prices go up too much and everyone is doing uh, Airbnb and from the flats normal inhabitants are removed from their flats basically so that's surely a problem then again of course the tourists also bring the money here there's always then again pro and contra The shifting is really totally fine. So I like to shift right here. Oh, there's an old Seat 124. <laughs> That's so funny. I mean, look at how design has evolved. And uh, probably you've seen uh, recently the Seat 600D vintage car, small vintage car review. If you haven't done so far, I can really recommend you to do that.
There you go. Very funny. Also inside the city, got a good acceleration from this turbo engine. So I think the engine is definitely sufficient. The acceleration figure is about 10 seconds to 100 kilometers an hour. So the engine fits the vehicle very well. If you go for the 115 or the 95 horsepower version, does it matter that much? I don't think so. Uh, a big step would be the 1.5 liter TSI. That has reason strength as you're using that car for sportier driving. Also, maybe need more acceleration on the motorway. Um, the, uh, the consumption figure will not necessarily be higher with the bigger engine because the 1.5 liter TSI is a very good engine. More displacement, um, you can run it at lower RPMs. And it also has this cylinder on demand technology, which is keeping the consumption down too. So it's more a matter of entry level price, which is of course lower with this vehicle. And I think this vehicle here will be um, you know, very well received because it has still a very good price performance ratio. So here again, we go some slalom style here with rotor tested one. See again how well the car responds to my steering commands. That's really nice. And let's test the turning circle. Start here, turn all the way around. Well, that's good. So, also good in this respect. So, again, from driving, I think the only negative thing we could find is a little bit more wind noises as it is an SUV at higher motorway speeds. Other than that, I think very good performance by this small SUV. And now another driving part with the 1.5 liter Evo. Famous new four cylinder engine with cylinder on demand technology. And this is the biggest, most powerful engine that is available for this very vehicle. And let's see how it performs. What's the difference to the one liter petrol engine? Mm, of course, it offers you a little bit more power, more fun and stuff. Then again, you always have to keep in mind about the entry price. I mean, if you just say, oh, you know, I don't really care about the money. I just want the best Arona, the most fun Arona I can get. Oh, well, there's another one in orange again, the one we drove yesterday. Um, you know, then you can go with this one here. That's a steep hill, nice. <laughs> but then again, if you think about, you want a good price performance deal, then the one liter small petrol engine surely makes more sense. So what do you feel? The engine is also very silent again. Gives you more power from the lower RPM regions. For example, if I'm driving 50 in the fourth gear. Now I also see the small eco sign. It's like a small arrow and that shows me always when the cylinder on demand technology is active so it's good that we actually see when it is working so two cylinders are just shut off there when you're basically just rolling just coasting to save some fuel so whereas the one liter turbo engine sometimes when you, you know, want some boost you really have to push it here you can be a little bit more gentle but already get the same power output um, so even if you're in third gear now and you push it, there's something happening, you know? So you don't have to get it to the all RPMs like with the smaller engine. Let's go to the roundabout here now. You can test a little bit of the agility. And you can also see I don't have to turn the steering wheel that much. That's again part of this progressive steering which is uh, which comes very handy. That's really nice. Also, have a little bit better control when going in slalom. The thicker steering wheel helps you to control the car. By the way, now we are passing Circuit Telamar. That's a, it's a historic racetrack 
we've been there with the Leon generations, definitely check out this um, this review. Also, nice Leon Cupra here. So now we can accelerate it out here just a little bit. Uh, for example, when we do some 40 kilometers to uh, 70, being in the second gear, let's go. Blop, that's always 75. You see, this is what the bigger engine is all about. It's still a relatively light car, and that means that when you have the bigger engine here, you have plenty of power. Or if you're, for example, driving fully loaded. Again, when you're keeping it low RPMs, the engine is very silent and very well to use. Even on the fourth gear, you can push it, turbo sets in, you get more power. Um, at the same time, it does not necessarily mean that you would have a bigger consumption. So that really depends on how you drive it. Um, let's go to the driving data and reset the consumption. Because when I'm not doing the acceleration test now and driving it just a little steadier, let's see what we can get. Remember in the other one, it was around 6 liters. Also with a lot of motorway part, as we had here today. Sometimes when you take the bigger engines, but let it run at a little lower RPM, we sometimes even scored less consumption. So let's see how that one plays out here. Again, the car has a really good handling, although it is an SUV. Yes, and the Visa does drive sportier. But, you know, it's just a little difference as they share the same platform. You also get good agility from this one here. So easy to control steering wheel, six-speed manual again. Um, I do calculate with the DSG availability at a later stage for this engine here. Let's get on the motorway. Shifting, by the way, is uh, again a little crisp, you know, crisper as we expect. Sometimes we have that's just flawless, you know, it goes all the way through without any resistance. Here's some resistance. If you want that little sporty driving feeling, you would appreciate that. Good overview, although the side mirrors have those, you know, sharp design, but it goes quite wide, so you can see very well there. Now to sixth gear, and let's see how low we can keep the RPM. I'll put in the ACC. Now we're driving 100 kilometers an hour, just about 2,000 RPM. I think that's also quite good result. When we're going a little bit uphill now, the cylinder on demand technology is not active. However, now when it goes a little bit downhill, then I see the eco sign again. Now the cylinder on demand technology is active and we are basically driving a two cylinder. That's of course really funny. And let's see if we can yeah see the, the real the, the current consumption, like the life consumption. So at the moment it's about just about six liters, the life consumption. Now it drops down a little bit, 5.7. It's always interesting to look at it with at its live consumption figures because when you go going uphill now, for example, 7.8, 8 liters, just you know the slight differences in the road, 9 liters now, so just those slight differences make such a big impact then on the overall consumption. And what I would really like to know is when we're going then the next step a little bit down here more again how the consumption changes when the cylinder on demand technology is active. That will be very interesting and is definitely soon to come. 100 kilometers an hour is, by the way, a good motorway speed. Then also the you know, wind noise are pretty much okay. At 120, 130, then you know, it starts to get a little bit annoying. But overall still, I mean, it's a good level. Not as good as in the Ibiza due to the building form, but overall you you cannot really uh, complain that much. So now it starts to get downhill. 
now the cylinder on demand technology, yeah. It also says two cylinder mode. Now it's active. And well, it's about one liter now just when we're rolling down. So that brings our consumption really down again. And now it's just basically zero in the, in the moment where the car is sailing, is coasting, doesn't use the engine at all, and we're driving flat, stays in two cylinder mode, and is using now about two liters, three liters. So it will rise a little bit, but we have already tested that one here in several cars. This engine does work pretty well. It gives you enough performance and also uh, you know, the possibility for fuel savings. So I think it is the best engine for the car. But again, just if money doesn't play the biggest role, what we can also say from experience comparing those engines, yes, you have more performance, but the three cylinder is enough from the performance for this car. Uh, you won't really miss a stronger engine, so if you're searching for a lower entry price, you'll be just fine with the other engine. Of course, in the motorway, when you do want to accelerate a little bit, fourth gear, pushing it, it goes forward again. That's a little bit easier than, you know, especially when you're on the motorway. The question is always, so where are you really driving the car? Which possibilities do you have to go fast or slow? It's also a nice view in the tunnel, by the way. How the GPS looks like and also the instruments, for example. Again, also when it's dark, it's quite good that you have this big panoramic windscreen. So a very good overview to the front. That's, by the way, also a difference to other normal small vehicles, that you have this good view out of the front. Next chance we get over off the motorway to give you some other driving impressions. Now on the two cylinder mode, three and a half liters of consumption, so it really works. Nice thing. So let's see which we have as a you know, average consumption now. About 5.9. So and when we have, you know, basically get off here as well so we have to first pass the peage it's a really annoying thing, annoying thing when we were driving on Spain or on France you always have those peage stations in Germany it's all free the motorways but there are also some politicians who want to change that and we have to see how that one plays out <laughs> So, um, you see here that the bigger engine, when we have compared them in motorway driving, basically has the same consumption, maybe at some point even a little bit lower. And I think that, you know, stress the point which we made earlier, that downsizing is not necessarily good for the consumption. Maybe you can offer them a little bit cheaper, for example, as the entry price level engines. Um, but you know, it's about the regulations from the EU that concentrate on the CO2 output on paper. That's the reason behind it. So, overall, again, a good driving performance here with the 1.5 liter engine. Which one would you actually go for? to do one fun riding part with very agile driving so this one here exclusive then with the Arona FR with the 1.5 liter Evo you can see again the performance of the steering I can keep my hands at the steering wheel don't have to grab over basically how steep the corner is you know the angle is then mirrored in the, in the you know in, in the steering that is really good it's handy in the city that you don't have to turn away all around and especially great in sporty driving so when it goes up and downhill now 
when you, for example, staying in a, in a th third or fourth gear, the 1.5 liter engine always have enough power reserve. It's really a very fun engine. Well, what a view here now. This is the, um, the coastal route going, th uh, going to Sitges near Barcelona. It's always a you know, very nice road to drive. It's really hard to get out and film from the outside here. That's not possible that good and that, 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 that well, but it's surely a lot of fun to drive here at the coastal side. If you're driving in the higher gears, by the way, you hardly hear anything from the engine. And again, driving down, the eco mode is active, but the car is either running completely on the coastal mode, <laughs> coast, the coasting mode on the, on the coastal street, yeah, or then just the two cylinder mode is active. So it's really funny, you know, that you step up from a three cylinder to a four cylinder to have the two cylinder mode. It's funny, isn't it? Uh, I think I'll let the car behind us pass just for a moment because then we have a free road again. It's even, you know, nicer for you to watch. Just leave them drive. So that's it. Okay, pushing it a little bit. Here now you can see it again. How the steering wheel corresponds with the angle of the road. Especially in those sportier driven corners, the thicker steering wheel gives you a little bit more feedback, more to hold on to basically. It says even I should go to a sixth gear now with 80, then the car will recall again, it consumes less. And I think very fastly we'll have to we have catched up with the vehicles in front of us. Really effortless driving. So I think, especially driving-wise, if you compare the other small SUVs, I think this one here probably feels among the best driving-wise, especially when you have it a little bit sportier. Really nice. And we already caught up to the other cars, although we are not really driving very fast overall when you consider the speed limit. So, some nice corners for you to leave you out of the driving part for today. That's then, you know, really it from, from driving. <laughs> A little bit slower, second gear 40, throttle 60. That's how it goes in the second gear. And of course, we've driven the 1.5 a little bit longer now, motorway and some acceleration and some downhill. So what's now again the final consumption conclusion for today for the bigger engine? 5.3 liters on one kilometer. So yeah, again, a little bit less than with the smaller engine. Hope you enjoyed all the driving impressions for the day. And now to our conclusion, Seat Arona. Overall, a good price performance ratio, a very versatile car, definitely. Not too long on the exterior, but still a lot of room on the interior, that's important. Very good build quality on the, in, in, on, on the interior. Yes, some cost saving past we have found, which could be a little bit better, but in your overall driving life, most of the things uh, will not play the biggest effect. We've shown the style interior today. There are also other options available. You can also individualize the car. Driving-wise, it also performed very well in basically all of the situations we had. It's an easy car to drive. It's very comfortable. So you can drive a small car, but already have a lot of comfort and even for taller drivers, no problem at all. Just as it has this SUV building style, when you drive at very high speeds, then you will, of course, hear a little bit more wind noises. Then again, you have a higher entry, easier entry, get in and out of the car. So it serves many modern needs, you know, for people who want more comfort because they maybe, 
you know, a little bit older now. Then again, for younger people to have, you know, more possibilities, maybe also uh, suitable even for a small family, because even though it's not that long, you still have also a bigger boot than with a normal uh, non-SUV small car. So this vehicle really has a lot of advantages. It's not exactly my personal design favorite with the contrast roof, so I would rather go with you know elegant line with, uh, with one vehicle color. But I mean, why not offer it to spice it up a little bit? And you know, if someone likes it, I think it's good that you also have this um, you know this option to go for. So I think this is it about today for the Seat Arona. Definitely a very hot competitor in this very segment. A segment in general is booming at the moment. One of the very, uh, you know, very little segments that are still thriving worldwide. And you know, it's not too big, it's not too high, but just right as you need it. Basically, it's all the car you need. Thank you so much. I would look forward to your feedback to this very vehicle, exterior, interior, and what we've shown you while driving. And, um, you know, we've already shown you some of the competitors here and will, of course, continue to do so because there are a lot of new cars at the moment in this segment. And, of course, we'll continue our coverage there as well. Thank you so much for tuning in. Also, support the whole team and tune in next time.